Hello everyone, my name is Avi Shah, and in this video I'm going to be going over a next-gen method of DNA sequencing known as solid DNA sequencing. So before I begin, I'm going to go over some background. The solid DNA sequencing method is based off of a method known as polony sequencing, which was developed by George M. Church at Harvard University. Solid sequencing itself was developed by Applied Biosystems, and it was ready around 2007 and made commercially available in 2008. Its main advantage is that it's very cost effective. Only 13 cents, 0.13 US dollars, to sequence 1 million bases. Its main disadvantage is that it has trouble sequencing sequences with palindromic sequences within them. And I'm going to go over this disadvantage later on in this presentation. So here's a process overview of the solid method. First step is sample preparation. The second step is amplification of the samples via PCR. The third step is ligation chemistry and imaging, and this is basically just data collection. And the fourth step is data analysis. Now I'm going to go over the first step of DNA sequencing using the solid method, and that's sample preparation. So the way solid sequencing works is it sequences millions of different DNA fragments in parallel. And to get these millions of fragments, we need to fragment genomic DNA. And this fragmentation can be achieved in one of three ways. The first is nebulization, where compressed nitrogen or air is used to force the DNA through small holes, creating mechanically sheared fragments. The second method is sonication, where ultrasonic waves are used to resonate with the DNA at its natural frequency, causing the DNA to shear at random intervals. And the third method is digestion with restriction enzymes. The final step of sample preparation is ligation of adapter sequences. So as you can see in this diagram, there are two adapters that are uh, ligated to the, to the DNA fragments. And these are universal. These adapters are referred to as the P1 and P2 adapter. The P1 adapter attaches to the 5' prime position, and the P2 adapter attaches to the 3' prime position. And so the result is DNA fragments, millions of DNA fragments, each, uh, each ligated, each with P1 and P2 adapters attached to them. The next step in solid DNA sequencing is amplification of fragmented DNA, and this is achieved via PCR. The first step in amplification is uh, hybridization to beads, and these beads are very special because they're covered in sequences, uh, segments of DNA that correspond to the P1 adapter. So this P1 adapter um, that was attached to this fragments of DNA during uh, sample preparation allow the, the fragments to now bind to this, uh, to this PCR bead. And so now each fragment binds to its own bead. And the reason each fragment can bind to its own bead is because there are uh, lots of beads, more beads than sequences, um, and they outnumber them uh, significantly so that once all of the fragments have bound to their own bead, about 80% of the beads are still empty. Only about 20% have their own fragment bound. The next step is PCR. And so now millions of copies of the template strand that were attached to the bead via the P1 adapter are now created and attached to that same bead. So now each bead has millions of copies of the same fragment of DNA. And these are called polonies, uh, which is a combination of the word polymerase and colonies. So now we have polonies mixed in with empty PCR beads. But we have to get rid of them because we don't want these empty PCR beads to take up space on the array, uh, to take up resources. So we need to get rid of them somehow. Well, first we're going to gather all the good beads. And to fix this problem, we're going to add even more beads. These are going to be polystyrene beads, but these are also special because they're coated with P2. Now, if you recall, the fragments uh, were, were prepared with P2 um, at the other end, and they have P1 bound to the center of the PCR bead. So all around the PCR bead, we have P2, and this P2 allows each PCR bead to uh, bind to a polystyrene bead. So now the PCR beads are bound to the large bead, and this creates a large bead-to-bead uh, -bead structure. And then you just centrifuge out the beads that you don't need, the empty beads, the empty PCR beads. And this is because this can be done because the, uh, the polystyrene structures are much less dense than the PCR beads. And that's because, as you can see in this diagram, um, and as they would seem in real life, uh, they're a lot more spaced out. Uh, the PCR beads, though, the amount of space that they occupy, they have a lot more mass. And so when you centrifuge them, 
the PCR beads that are empty are going to end up on the bottom, and on top you're going to have, on this, in the supernatant, the polystyrene bead structures. So now you have these polonies, and you're going to attach them to a glass slide, and they're going to bind covalently to the slide, and this slide is going to be used for the analysis phase of solid DNA sequencing. The next step is ligation chemistry and imaging, or in other words, data collection. The reagents for this part of the reaction are the template strands which we amplified during PCR, uh, primers to start the reaction, eight nucleotide long DNA probes with fluorescent dye attached, and ligase to append these probes to primers and to the ends of other probes. So here's a process overview for ligation chemistry. The first step is primer binding to the template strands. The second step is probe hybridization and ligation via ligase. The third step is measurement of fluorescence on these probes. And the fourth step is cleaving that fluorescent end of the probe and the three nucleotides that go with it. The fifth step is to repeat the first four steps six or more times, however many times you need to cover the entire length of the fragment being sequenced. Uh, and this process is completed five times, and each time the primer is offset by one base. Uh, if this doesn't really make sense right now, don't worry because I'm going to explain this more in depth. So here's the anatomy of that eight nucleotide probe that I was talking about on the previous slide. Uh, at the at the far left, you have um, you have the two di you have the two nucleotides that are actually uh, that are actually nucleotides, um, and each one is one of the four canonical bases. Uh, and each dinucleotide permutation corresponds to a dye color. So all the way at the right, you have, uh, I put a four-pointed star to represent the dye, and the fluorescent dye is going to correspond to four dinucleotide possibilities. There's 16 possible dinucleotide permutations, and so each dye color uh, corresponds to four of these, um, and there are four different colors, red, green, blue, or orange. In the middle, we have three universal bases, and these universal bases um, uh, they haven't been released, uh, the actual chemical compound, because this is a proprietary process, um, but it's likely some universal base like uh, nitropyrrole, nitroindole, deoxyinosine, or inosine, something of that sort. Uh, and then at the end, you also have another three universal bases, uh, and these are going to correspond to that dye, and uh, after the third step, they're going to be cleaved, um, after the, the fluorescent snapshot is taken, once the fluorescent dye is imaged. Uh, those three nucleotides are going to be cleaved, and that's going to leave the dinucleotide uh, sequence all the way at the left, and three universal bases at the middle. So now I'm going to go over the process in more depth. Uh, so the first step of the process, like I said uh, earlier, is primer binding. And there's a lot of content on this slide, but you only have to worry about what's in the center. The fragment that's being sequenced is going to um, have a primer. Uh, and this primer is going to anneal to it because it corresponds to the P1 adapter, that universal P1 adapter. And so after that primer anneals, probes are going to attach. The probe is also going to anneal right after that primer. And then ligase is going to make sure that the probe is firmly in place by joining the backbones of the probe uh, to that primer. If there's already a probe, um, another probe isn't going to attach to the primer. The next probe is going to uh, ligate. Uh, to the probe that came before it. So it's going to anneal, and then the ligase is going to anneal the two probes. So the second, third, fourth, every probe after the first is just going to anneal um, after the probe that came before it and ligate to the probe that came before it, to the backbone of the probe that came before it. Then the fluorescent snapshot is taken. A laser is going to excite the fluorescent dye, and the, and the fluorescent dye is going to release a lower energy photon. Uh, and that photon is going to leave and be detected by uh, some detector that's going to measure that fluorescence and record it. Then the dye end is cleaved. So the fluorescent dye and the three nucleotides at the end of the probe are going to be cleaved, and that's going to leave five nucleotides on the probe. Uh, it's also going to leave a free 5' prime phosphate end. And so what this does is it allows the next probe to attach and ligase to bind that probe, to bind the backbones of that probe to the, to the backbone, uh, to the 3' prime end of the next probe. So here's the result of round one, uh, incomplete data. All you have is one probe attached, and you only have one fluorescent dye measurement. You only have one color in the computer. So you only know the first base. So to get the rest of them, you need to complete more cycles. But we only have fluorescence measurements for every fifth base, because if you look here, if you keep adding probes, you do have more colors and you do have more data. But the issue is you have three universal bases in the middle, so you only have a color for every fifth base. Because remember, each dinucleotide, um, each dinucleotide color, each uh, each one that corresponds to a dye, is only going to help you decode one base. 
So you're going to have to offset by one base and do the whole thing over again four times, a total of five times, like I said in the overview slide. So if you remember the sequence from the previous slide, uh, that corresponds to the second row on this slide, the n minus 1. And so you're going to have to complete the reaction for a primer offset of n minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4, and just n. And so if you see, if you overlay all of these results, uh, one on top of another, you're going to have a full sequence of colors. And using this, you'll be able to decode the entire uh, fragment sequence, its nucleotide sequence, using something called two-base color encoding. The final step of the process is data analysis. So we're going to take all of that color data that we have from the previous slide, and we're going to analyze it using something called two-base encoding. So I'm going to reintroduce my mouse cursor here. And what we have now is a thymine. We know that this first base is a thymine because it's part of that universal P1 adapter. So here we can see that this thymine lines up to this adenine. And this adenine, uh, this adenine is part of a probe that had an orange dye attached to it. The computer recorded this as an orange dye. So if we use this chart, the first base is thymine, and it corresponds to an orange dye. So this orange dye with thymine corresponds to a cytosine. The next base is going to be a cytosine. And that's correct. We can see here it's a cytosine. This cytosine then corresponds to a red guanine. So let's see what that shows us on the chart. Cytosine with red gives us a guanine as our next base. So that's correct. The next base is a guanine. This guanine corresponds to a green cytosine. Guanine with green gives us thymine as the next base. That's correct. The next base is thymine. And if you see, this goes for the rest of the sequence. And this is good because if you also know the end, uh, the end nucleotide, you can do the same process backwards. And because of that, you can actually sort of double check the sequence. And this allows for uh, greater capabilities in detecting something called SNPs, uh, signal nucleotide polymorphisms. You can also detect uh, things like insertions and deletions uh, more easily using this method than other next-gen sequencing methods. And so basically, this process is just using a base and a color to define the next base in the sequence. Now, if you recall from the beginning of the presentation, I said that the solid sequencing method has trouble with palindromic sequences. So what is a palindromic sequence? Well, it's a sequence of DNA that, when read in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, has a complement in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction that's the same as it. So let's take a look at this first sequence. We have A, T, A, T read in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Its complement read in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction is the same, A, T, A, T. So this is a palindromic sequence. This sequence is not palindromic because it's A, T, T, A in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, but its complement is T, A, A, T in the, th in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Therefore, it's not palindromic. And here at the bottom, I've outlined a more complex palindromic sequence, uh, CGGATATCCG. In the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, it's the same as, uh, as its complement, CGGATATCCG. So let's see why this would cause problems in solid sequencing. The reason it would cause a problem is because, and here you can see I've taken the same example as from the previous slide, uh, it's because the first half of this sequence corresponds to this, this sequence in the complement. CGGAT corresponds to GCCTA. So in the single-stranded form, when you only have this sequence uh, floating around, you're going to have issues because this part of the sequence, GCCAT, is going to wrap around. And this G is going to bind to this C. This C is going to bind to this G. This C is going to bind to this G, and so on. And when you have longer palindromic sequences, it's going to create longer uh, longer self-binding. And this self-binding uh, this self-binding occurrence results in this sort of structure uh, called a hairpin. And this is an issue because if you look here, this single-stranded DNA successfully has DNA probes attached to it. These dinucleotide probes uh, all attach successfully. But the issue with the hairpin is that because it bound to itself, these nucleotide probes, these dinucleotide probes can't attach. This DNA is completely inaccessible to the probes. So that's why palindromic uh, sequences cause issues. They just can't be sequenced because the DNA becomes inaccessible and there's not enough data sometimes. Now, because this process is very involved and very complicated, I'm just going to review everything briefly. So the first step in this process is sample preparation. 
And if you remember, we fragment genomic DNA into millions of different fragments uh, randomly using one of three methods, nebulization, sonication, or digestion via restriction enzymes. Then we, uh, we ligate these adapters, these universal P1 and P2 adapters to these fragments of DNA. Next, uh, we can amplify this DNA um, and we create something called polonies on those beads. And these beads are then attached to a glass array, which is used in the analysis phase of the, of the process to actually get the data. Then we have all of these polonies and we have uh, cycles. In each cycle, we have a fluorescent dye reading. So here we have a polony which in its first, uh, in its first cycle had red and adenine as its first base. In the second cycle, it had a green fluorescent dye and guanine as its first base and so on. Each polony uh, has a color and its first nucleotide associated with it. And this is completed for, uh, for however many cycles are needed to cover uh, the largest fragment length. And then uh, each time the primer is offset by one. And so this allows the computer that's actually doing all this analysis for the millions of different fragments to sequence millions of different uh, DNA fragments at the same time simultaneously.